I uh, did an uh, interview with our next speaker not too long ago, uh, and so that happened at his uh, area of Boldy's Quarters, um, and he uh, brings a wealth of information. And I want to ask everybody, please, let's uh, make sure that we save time for everyone else. Um, but uh, 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 Alan was in, uh, involved with a Ken uh, project. He's going to share a little bit of information with that. And I think that that's going to be the avenue. It's not actually Dundalk TV. It's the community coming together. Uh, I want to support but um, the bringing people together to change Baltimore uh, County Committee. I think that that's really where it's going to happen. Yeah. Alan um, has a great insight into that. And there's also other people in the audience that were a part of that as well. Uh, uh, Alan, please come forward. Please welcome him. Alan. <laughs> Good evening. This is a long story. It only takes about six hours. We we'll condense it down into as little time as possible. But initially, we had something called a CZMP, and that was a comprehensive map zoning process. That was a way that once every four years, there would be a process to, to say which properties get rezoned, and it would be announced, it would be posted, and people had the opportunity to go in and speak, not just before the planning board, but also before the county council. These thoughts and ideas were to be taken into consideration. And instead of constantly changing and having to be on the alert for zoning changes, this was the process that was to work within the county. Then along came this thing called PUDs. PUDs were a way to, to make a mixed use development all in one location. Instead of trying to change this little parcel to retail, this to commercial, this to residential, but to mix everything together. But it was a good thing in that it smoothed out the process instead of having a long list of CCMP processes. It was supposed to be for areas greater than 100 acres. But over time, the developers got their fingers into it because they saw an opportunity. With this process of the PUD, the, the various legislators have changed the PUD so that now they have legislation that talks about density for PUDs of less than an acre getting prorated to that of a DR-16 zone. So we've gone from over 100 acres to a half or a quarter of an acre. A half acre one was actually proposed, but they couldn't come up with a community benefit. With this process, they were supposed to take the density that was allowed based on zoning and condense it down into one area and make it walkable, reduce the amount of transportation that was needed, and to provide opportunity for work close to homes. What they've done, oh, what was gonna to happen to the rest of the space? It was gonna be open space. You didn't need funds for open space. You didn't need to collect money in the taxes. You created the open space by taking the density of a large area and moved it to a smaller area. It helped the developers because it was less infrastructure needed. They didn't have to proliferate and go out into vast areas. Everything made sense until the legislators got a hold of the process. Now, the PUDs the, can have in the resolution the density designated. And it's just a stroke of the pen has nothing to do with zoning, nothing to do with what's agreed upon, nothing to do with what's needed. It's how much money does the developer want to make. We've had an experience with one of those PUDs. It's the Galloway Creek LLC. That's a very significant project in that no PUDs were allowed outside the URL. What's an URL? The Urban Rural Demarcation Line. That's where you have intense development on the interior and the outside area is to be rural, is to be detached individual family homes, and the state has labeled a lot of these areas limited development zones. So why put a PUD outside a limited development area? To make money. Those are the nice areas. So in our area, in Bowley's Quarters, our prior county councilman, Joe Bartenfelder, put through a law that allowed a PUD outside the Ertl only in Bowley's Quarters and only on Marina Zone property. How many properties do you think that affected? Not many. What? So, later he put through the resolution to put it on a 14-acre site. 
The problem with the 14 acre site was that it only consisted of three and a half acres of marina zoning. The rest was all RC, resource conservation. We couldn't get that across through the input meetings because they were just cursory, courtesy. Here's your chance to come in and talk and then we're gonna ignore what you have to say. But you have the chance to speak. We put these input meetings together. We went and spoke before the council. We had a lot to say. They listened to us and heard what we had to say, but they didn't react to it. So what eventually happened with this PUD? It was denied initially in 2003 by a cursory review in Baltimore County. They didn't even have to submit a plan. They just submitted a letter with some notes for a 26 to 30 acre PUD at this site. It was denied and was said, no, the causes of grandfathering do not apply. There was no uh, sewer lines down in the area and this was a limited development area. You could do four or five individual homes. Not based on zoning. If it was based on zoning, they're allowed three houses. But it was based on the fact that there's an exception that for each individual property that you had, you were allowed to put up a house. It protected property owners' rights. That's why that's there. It's a good feature. So they would be allowed to put up six houses since they had six properties. Well, lo and behold, we have Hurricane Isabel come in. The septic systems have a problem. So they put down the sewer lines to protect the environment to help the bay because what we had developed down there that were shore shacks into individual family homes were we were contributing to the pollution in the bay and this would solve that problem. But it wasn't supposed to be to expand development on any type of subdivisions. It was to help the property owners who had a lot who couldn't develop with individual infill. Well, they still couldn't put it down in Bowley's quarters and without using the PUD process. So that's when Joe Bartenfelder had to change the laws. Then we come up to 200 to 2007 and he submits the resolution and our community association starts fighting. Well, we got it to the appeals board. There was no record by the planning board. So the appeals board had to deny the PUD. Lo and behold, we won for about this long. <laughs> Suddenly, Kevin Kamenitz puts through a bill. And the reason why he put through a bill is so that the developer didn't have to appeal. No, that isn't why he put through the bill. But as a result of him putting through a bill, changing the PUD laws, the developer no longer had to appeal. He could ask for a reconsideration. At the time, Kevin Kamenitz wasn't our councilman, so we needed to reach out. And we reached out to six other organizations, one in each district. And we had them go in and talk to their councilman. And we said, we didn't want that bill. It wasn't something for good for the community. Fortunately, the, the community out in Kevin's area was very strong and very forceful. And this group of six, or actually it was seven, it was six plus us, got the bill withdrawn. There went the reconsideration. That was the beginning of a group called CAN. CAN was a network, not an organization. It stands for a Community Association Network. And it was a group of community organizations that started communicating with each other. And together, we can make a difference. That was our slogan. Well, it didn't take long before Jim Smith, our, then our county executive, put through a bill through the president of the council, which I believe at that time was Joe Bartenfelder. What a coincidence. <laughs> and it said you can remand a PUD back to the planning board at any time. Regular development can be remanded. It's in the laws. But PUDs were a special shortcut process that helped the developer and helped the county streamline the process so that it wasn't going to be real expensive to do, but it would be beneficial because of all the good things that were originally in it. Well, this bill, at the request of Jim Smith, went in to remand back at any time, and that's why it was denied, because they couldn't remand it and because they didn't have a record. They didn't create a record of what was said and what wasn't justified for what they call variations of standards. 
Well, that gave the builder an opportunity to, you guessed it, ask for a reconsideration. Didn't have to appeal again. This time we reached out and through hubs around the county, we put together 140 different community associations. Not one of them wanted this remand process back in place. It got withdrawn. The lawyers for this county indicated, oh, we withdrew that because it was redundant. Well, why did they spend the time putting a bill together, putting it out to the council, making all the communities come in and comment on it when it was redundant? Well, that left them with a problem. They didn't have any bills. They've tried that twice and the PUD was denied. Mr. Smith decided to put through a motion to intervene. Very interesting. Suddenly, the appeals board reversed its decision, reviewed this and said, no, we can remand it back. So that was appealed. It went up to the court and we agreed with, uh, because the court said we can't look at it. They were going to keep sending it back to the appeals board. The appeals board would keep trying to send it back. We would appeal it and go back to court. And they said there has to be a way to solve this process. Well, in Bill 5-10, submitted by Kevin Kamenetz, he gave us the opportunity to have a hearing on PUDs for the very first time. So he gave us something in one hand. I'll get back to that in a minute. So we went through a process. We went through an 11 day hearing. After those 11 days, the administrative law judge denied the PUD. He denied it for two reasons. One, it's a 14 acre PUD and you don't have 14 acres of marina zoning. Number two, it didn't coincide with the master plan. It violated the master plan that was deciding how development was going to occur around the county that people spent thousands of hours working on. And it was something that was really touted as a strong document for here's how we're going to do things in the county. And this didn't comply with it. Well, they got appealed. I know you're shocked. However, in the appeal, they said that it wasn't a 14 acre PUD. It consisted of two parcels, one that was two and a half acres and one that was 11 and piece acres. And the appeals board said, the guy got it wrong. After listening to 11 days of testimony, after all the documents that went in, the application that said a 14 plus acre site, the resolution that said a 14 acre site, and all the comments from each department in the county that talked about 14 plus or minus acres, all that was wrong. This was a two and a half acre PUD. Oh, very interesting. Then they said, let's go back to Bill 5-10. It used to be the PUDs had to comply with the county regulations, with the master plan. They stuck in or approval by the Office of Planning. When they put that bill in, and Eric was one of the people who helped comment on that, we were talking about why give the Department of Planning a chance to make the law on their own? They have to abide by what the master plan says. The other side said, well, they coordinate the master plan. Yes, they do with a lot of input from the community. And back then we had input. So now that got in there and the board, planning board, or not the planning board, the office of planning had approved this PUD because they report to the people who got elected. Very interesting. So now the very same thing that gave us the hearing got the PUD reversed along with the change in the zoning. However, these PUD laws restrict the density to 16 units per acre unless it's an elevator zone, a high rise area. Well, this PUD wanted 36 units. 36 units, when you divide it by two and a half, is a lot more than four. Well, why is four important? Because four units per acre is the amount of units that you can have in a limited development area. That's designated by the state. So now it's violating state law and there's no process in the county that's allowed to circumvent the state laws. Additionally, on that two and a half acres, I told you about the RC property, the resource conservation. 0.79 acres of that was RC5. That meant you only have 1.7 acres of marina property. 
You divide the 36 units into 1.7, you now have 20 units per acre in a limited development area, which now also violates the PUD laws. I hope most people in here understand that part of the process. The appeals court in Baltimore County didn't understand it. The planning board didn't understand it. And the appeals court in the state of Maryland didn't understand it. They simply said, well, Baltimore County has been doing this since 1992 or 1990, and we're going to rely on them to do this correctly. What kind of an appeal process is that? There was no independent judgment. The people who were appealed, they just said, we're going to listen to what they do because they're the experts. So now the project's appealed, but we're appealing the variation of standards that was just adopted. We've never had a chance to speak out against those. And I don't have time to go into those tonight, but it isn't just the Galloway Creek LLC. This is happening all over the county. You have your PUD down here. Miller's Island had a PUD. They kept wanting to put in 14 acres or put in 14 homes on a very small amount of acreage. The People's Council got involved excuse me, got involved and reduced it back to nine. It should have been reduced to six, but to this day it hadn't been built. So what is the point of a lot of this information? The communities working together, when we had 140 organizations tied up in a network, they actually accomplished some things and we worked together, but not as individuals in Dundalk or Police <coughs> Quarters or Middle River or Hopewell Point, but all over the county. And that's the type of thing that will show where the votes are. And that's the type of thing that will become effective. So that's where we're looking at moving forward from here. Hey, Alan, we have one question by Russ. We'll make a quick wrap up. We don't have a lot of time. Right? Okay, okay, Russ. One question. Did Baltimore County issue pictures and rain coats for this process? Did the issue? No. <laughs> no. I just had to know. But what did Baltimore County issue? Baltimore County issued Bill 5-10, which gave us the hearing, but also allowed the planning office to make their own decision. The county has issued Bill 5-13, which had to do with the Maryland 43 overlay district. Who issued that? Tom Quirk from the first district. Where's the 43? Over here in the sixth district. What does it say? It describes large properties and it says, Approval of the pattern book may allow waiver or modification of any applicable laws, regulations, requirements, or policies governing zoning or development of a property. So no matter what law or what code you put in, no matter what plan you write, all they have to do is put in a code or a law and say, oh, well, for this type of area, we're going to ignore that. What else did the county bring us? They brought us Bill 53-15 which is currently under process, and this is for regional outlet shopping centers. And it describes what can be built on a regional outlet shopping center and perfectly describes the Paragon project because that project was stalled. Now they have specific legislation to get around the stalling. You don't need a PUD. They're voting on that tonight. It's allowed by right. What else are they giving us? They're giving us PUD law 5415, that's allowing that monetary contribution to be a community benefit to a nonprofit entity, a county agency, a state agency, and it's identified in the council resolution support of civic, educational, vocational, and recreational programs. But it's going to the county and state agencies who review the process. It sounds like they could be buying approval. It just seems like it's a degree of impropriety. Speaking of degrees of impropriety, we were fighting these PUDs and we had it denied three times. We got it denied twice once they did it on their own. But then it changed law firms. Larry Schmidt started representing Galloway Creek when it went to the appeals board. After it got overturned and got approved, Jim Smith was no longer county executive. He went to work for the state. Then he left the state and went back to the law firm of Smith, Gilday, and Schmidt. <laughs> Mr. Gilday is representing the Hopewell Point case. 
Mr. Smith is the one who overturned the denial with the letter of with the motion to intervene. And now he's working for the law firm that gets paid by the company that his motion got it to move forward. No, he's not the direct attorney, but I'm sure there's profits coming out of their hundreds of dollars per hour fees that go to the partnership of which he's a partner. But it's not illegal. They're allowed to bill whatever they want to the developers as a law firm. The developer pays it. That's the good old American way. But it just raises that level of impropriety that gives the wrong appearance. It makes you wonder. It makes you say, hmm. So let's think about going forward as a united Baltimore County group. Not just Dundalk United, not just the community association, but as Baltimore County United with CAN, because together we can make a difference. Absolutely. Thank you. And now you know why I invited Alan here tonight. We have many dynamic speakers here tonight and would just like to think um, that if we had some of these people as our elected officials, uh, how things could be. They're standing on the right side of things. Uh, actually, uh, being from the Dundalk community, there's a lot of things going on that people were talking about at meetings when I first started attending. And so I threw my hat in the ring this last time because of all the bad stuff going on and the people saying they were tired of it. So um, I actually know that the system can work. Um, I was in there, um, did my very best, didn't win, but I believe that I made a difference. And if other people come forward from the community, we can actually have some people that are already working their tail ends off of the community try to do right things if they want to uh, come forward and run for office. I hope that that does happen. Um, I had a few people that I wanted to thank. I want to thank Christian Helmers for um, inviting uh, Eric uh, here tonight. Uh, I also would like to thank him for um, doing video work for uh, uh, Dundalk United in the past and supporting uh, things that Dundalk TV has done. He actually did an interview with uh, Mike Balecki, who is a was a professional baseball player who played on the fields here at the um, North Point Government Center, uh, as well as uh, Fuzzy Nelson um, actually be, uh, played pro football. So these fields here are very important, and it is a, a slap in the face to try to rip the heartbeat of the community uh, out of Dundalk, and we are fighting to save the North Point Government Center. I'd like to thank a few other people, and that would be um, uh, Carl Persiani, he, he came tonight. Uh, he's former um, president of the Dunlogan Association. Uh, Joe Greiser's here from the uh, Norwood Hollibird. Uh, thank you for coming, uh, Joe and uh, Wendy. Um, also, Scott Pappas came um, from the um, uh, Fort Howard, and he he was to be a speaker. He got here a little bit late. Uh, I was going to let him speak about Fort Howard, but uh, thank you very much for filling that in, Russ. And uh, Dave Fitzpatrick, he uh, actually helped put uh, signs on the float. He was on the float this year in the 4th of July parade. He comes to everything. He's uh, one of the people that, that um, is a little bit in the background, but he's working his tail end off. And I also heard that from, um, oh, geez, let's see. Um, hmm. uh, I wish I could remember his name right now. Uh, but, but he was heading the Fort Howard Project. We're talking about, I'm talking about, Yes. Al Classing. Yes. Al Classing had the highest praise for you, and so do I. Uh, great job uh, you're doing. Um, and I'd like to thank my friend Marcy Lewandowski, who does a lot of computer work for me, helps put these meetings together, helps me uh, going, uh, keep on going. I would also like to say that uh, talking about how the system works is that our governor is in office right now. He's doing one hell of a job, yes. and he's moving our community forward. Uh, he is changing Maryland, and I would just like to let our elected officials know that if you got on board, actually you could be doing a great job as well. But uh, for some reason or another, um, you just feel like you need to put roadblocks up, and uh, that's not getting us anywhere. But let's uh, take Larry Hogan's, um, uh, the way he's doing things, and uh, start moving Baltimore County forward and Maryland forward. 